Okay, hi everybody. Uh, welcome back uh, after this morning's session. So uh, I'm going to start uh, a section on a much more specific question. You know, whether you worked out the relationships of your your pathogens, you looked at your confidence of your assembling the sequencing. We're going to talk about how do you annotate one particular set of features, which is antimicrobial resistance genes. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a reminder that uh, we've got the CCBYSA, so you can use this material within in the license, and my slides are available for download. Okay, so uh, I'm Andrew MacArthur. Uh, I'm a professor at McMaster University. Uh, I'm in the DeGroote School or Institute for Infectious Disease Research, as well as the David Braley Center for Antibiotic uh, Discovery. My group focuses around essentially enabling public health and researchers and companies to combat AMR using genomic data. So we build databases and algorithms to, to annotate and understand the mechanisms and the drugs behind AMR. So the objectives uh, today, uh, we'll talk a little background on the molecular basis of antimicrobial resistance, because that's one of the reasons this is hard. We'll talk about how reference sequence databases are created and used and can be trusted or not. Uh, in the lab, we will actually predict antimicrobial resistance genes from genome assemblies, as well as metagenomic sequencing reads, such as wastewater. And really, my goal here is to, to understand the promises, but particularly the pitfalls and assumptions uh, when it comes to phenotypic and genotypic prediction of AMR. So a little background. So the, the simple answer is that, you know, bacteria are evolving resistance faster than we can discover new drugs. Uh, so this antibiogram on the left uh, is from Spain. Uh, phenotypic testing, except for the last uh, row, and so, you know, on a Vitec robot or other plate, uh, basically, almost every antibiotic they try, they get a resistance profile. Uh, they got uh, one of their beta-lactams is working, is susceptible, and they do a PCR test for OXA48, uh, a carbapenemase. Um, some labs will only do phenotypic. Some will have a small battery of PCR, and others are in a position where they're already sequencing. So from the Canadian perspective, uh, this data is just pre-pandemic. You know, in 2018, 26% of infections resistance to drugs to treat them. That's supposed to be up to 40% by 2050. It's probably going to be higher because we had to use antibiotics so much to treat uh, secondary infection when we had COVID-infected patients. Uh, economically, up to 120 billion in hospital costs, 400,000 lives, uh, and almost 400 billion in GDP. Uh, we talk about lives, uh, but it's uh, just the quality of life as well. If you can't control secondary infection, you can't do a hip replacement, and there are hospitals in that situation. But also, you can't use chemotherapy. Basically, all of modern medicine relies on prophylactic use of antibiotics, and so we're at under threat of a post-antibiotic era. One of the reasons this is a, is a difficult area to work in is that it's not really a, you know, a one solution type approach to treat infection. We use a huge range of chemical diversity to combat bacteria, either to suppress their growth so the immune system can win the battle or to outright kill them. Uh, this is a, a huge range of chemical diversity. As a result, bacteria have evolved a huge range of defending themselves uh, against it. Uh, there's a timeline to discovery. So, you know, not only because we've used and abused antibiotics, we're getting resistance. At the same time, we're simply not finding more drugs. Uh, major new drug classes, you know, uh, have not really been found in decades. Uh, the golden era was the 70s, 80s, uh, and the 90s, for, for example. Uh, AI and other approaches are showing some promise of finding entirely new uh, backbones and chemical classes. But it is a double whammy. Uh, as we uh, lose the utility of antibiotics with animals and people, we no longer can rely on that a new one will show up on the market. And even when it does, uh, usually often a variant of a known antibiotic, it does not have long before resistance arrives. One of the key things I think to know is that these are not new pathogens. These are long-standing old enemies, tuberculosis, gonorrhea, for example, uh, though there are some new pathogens that we deal with or ones that have really changed in prevalence like Acinectobacter uh, boanii. Uh, and so 
we had a window there, you know, our grandparents' generation where victory seemed in hand. Uh, but now if you look at something like this Syria, uh, we just slowly have increasing resistant rates of all the drug classes. If you look at something like Pseudomonas originosa in cystic fibrosis patients, roughly every 10 years we lose a drug class. Uh, and so these are bacteria that we know a lot about. Uh, we thought we had a handle on and we're now losing the fight. One of the reasons that this is extremely difficult to solve, never mind the chemical discovery problem, is that AMR is within a One Health setting what's called a wicked problem. In other words, it's multi-sectorial. Uh, so this is one of Canada's model, uh, nicknamed the confusogram, of how pathogens and AMR genes might move around. Uh, so in the bottom right, we have the circle of human communities, uh, whether they're in their community or are traveling or hospitalized or in extended care. And then on the left, we see a larger circle there uh, that's around food production, sheep, swine, cattle, poultry, etc. But we have abattoirs, we have sewage and wastewater, we have disinfectants and household chemicals, we even have ethanol production, uh, aquaculture, uh, and rendering in all animal products. All of these are routes that genes and bacteria, pathogens can move around. We do not have a good sense of the weight of these arrows. Canada in particular has started the GRDI AMR2 project, essentially doing uh, culture and metagenomic sequencing over a large range of this confusogram. And this is a pretty simple model. Uh, if any of you from the UK, you know your model is about an order magnitude more complicated uh, to this. So we need a battery approaches. We, we need a good sampling strategy. Some places will be culture-based and you know sequencing colonies. Others will be doing whole metagenomic sequencing of an environment to, to stand in there. And translating this into risk profiles is one of the, the largest challenges. Despite all that, the metaphor for the bioinformatics is actually pretty simple. We sequence a sample using any variety of technology. So it could be Illumina, it could be PacBio, you know, it could be... Uh, uh, one of the larger sequencers. And with that sequence data, whatever condition it's in, we need to compare it to reference sequences to say, oh, I saw a TEM1, I saw a CTMX15. And with that, that leads to prediction of what's called the resistome, the collection of resistance genes in that sample. And that's the baseline for surveillance work uh, in public health. What genes are out there? How abundant are they? How are they moving around? The holy grail is on the bottom right. Can we take those genome sequences and actually predict phenotype, exactly what drug will fail and to what degree in, a, in an infection, for example? Can we use that to guide clinical decision making? Or at a population level, can we use it to, to come up with resist assessment profiles so we know where to intervene, where to spend our money? Because clearly we do cannot uh, intervene across that entire confusogram. We need to be very targeted. So when it comes to the, to the data science, the comparison of references and the, how you build those databases is called biocuration. And that's where my lab really focuses on that biocuration piece. Emma talked a lot about this in her talk about the, you know, the need for data standards and common language and rules on how you curate. Uh, that's the art of biocuration. The prediction of resistome is the bioinformatics, uh, how you take uh, sequencing data of varying quality and actually predict reliably what genes and mutations are in there. We write algorithms as well, but there's plenty of other great tools for that. And then where you see is the AI and the analytics uh, and the modeling coming in, in in the bottom right. We're going to talk a little bit about that today. So we're going to use uh, some stuff from my lab. We're going to look at the comprehensive antibiotic resistance database and its associated resistance gene identifier software. And we're going to show some of our machine learning work as well. Uh, you don't have to use CARD and RGI at all. There, we're going to talk about the diversity tools out there. Uh, there are a lot of tools that are designed for very specific purposes, and they may fit your needs uh, precisely. A little more background, right? We, we, we have all those different chemicals that we're assaulting bacteria with. So we're targeting different things such as the cell wall or DNA synthesis or folate synthesis, protein synthesis. As a result, there is a huge range of mechanisms. Bacteria may simply spit the drug back out. They may chew the drug up. They may modify the target so the drug bounces off, et cetera. So there are a lot of genes to track. And as has been a theme uh, in this course, this is all made worse by horizontal gene transfer. You know, essentially, we, we create resistance by misusing or underusing uh, antibiotics. And through antibiotics and vertical transmission in an infection, we get survivors that are resistant. 
if AMR was strictly vertical transmission, you know, uh, from from patient to patient, infection control would would be uh, a major player here. It's very important, but we could actually have higher success rates. But because of plasmids and transposons on the mobile, ele mobile elements, uh, it's much harder to control AMR. The the gene can move into the the background microbiome. It can switch its its host and to evade treatment uh, and show up in a completely different setting. And I always use this as an example as a snapshot of CARD. NDM1 is a resistance uh, gene that takes out basically one of some of our important reserve beta lactamases. The origin is a single Swedish tourist coming up with an infection in India and then being transferred to England for further treatment. Uh, it was a single point infection. It was associated with a plasmid in, in Klebsiella. And it broke out and became a hotspot acquired uh, infection. And through plasmids, this is what surveillance shows us today. These are the whole suite of pathogens that you can find this gene is from essentially one event. We don't know where it came from uh, originally. And beside those taxonomic names, you'll see little uh, indications of whether they're in a genome, a genomic island, a whole genome shotgun, or in a plasmid. Uh, and so they have uh, incorporated them. So this gene has incorporated itself in the genome. It's remained associated with many kinds of plasmids, uh, but also it's become associated with genomic islands uh, as well. So this makes suppressing this resistant gene even harder. So when we talk about software bioinformatics, I want to come from a threat perspective. So for those of you who are old enough, you know, this is Donnie Rumsfeld. This was George Bush's secretary of defense. And he did this quote that anyone giggled at at the time about the, the war in Iraq, uh, that there are known knowns, things that we know we know. There are known unknowns, that is, the things we know we don't know. And then there's the unknown unknowns, the things we don't know we don't know. And what he was doing was quoting black swan theory of how you design a framework to understand threat. So if we think of a, a public health lab that's looking at AMR in the community, the known knowns are the genes and the pathogens we are tracking. And this is not a long list. We, we do PCR for a limited number of often extended spectrum beta lactamases. We only culture or test for a certain number of bacteria. And that's all designed on what we know our risk in our community and our prevalence. We only really bring in the infectious disease uh, specialists when it doesn't light up on those things we're tracking and we have a mystery case. But because we're doing PCR for a small number of genes and doing culture for a small number of bacteria, there's tons of known unknowns. These are all the AMR genes that have been published about in the literature, but we're not routinely tracking them. Maybe they're just, they haven't shown up to your shore in your community yet. And we know that all genes evolve over time. So we don't know the degree of which there's a variance of no genes and that novel mutations have occurred. And then the unknown unknowns are the emergent threats, like the NDM1 gene that emerged in a single patient, or MCR, that uh, M1 that appeared in, uh, well, it was detected in China. We're not really sure where it's, it, its origins from in that case. Um, what is out of this DNA sequencing, as opposed to PCR and culture, promises to unlock a great deal of this. You do get the genes and path you're tracking, but you also get all the characterized genes and their variants and novel mutations. And there's a lot of science around in AI machine learning for emergent threat detection based on, on uh, genomes. And Finn McGuire and I have collaborated a bit on that. What this course is about, from my perspective, AMR, is there's a training gap. Uh, if you've been working in public health, uh, you've been tracking a small number of things, and now you're sequencing, and you might find a list of 40 genes and mutations in the pathogen you're studying, and you don't know what to do with it all. There's a bit of an info overload, uh, as well as just the, the skill set to make accurate annotations. So that's what we're here about today. A couple more things. There are some vectors to think about this data. So... On the left is your question that you're looking for perfect match screening. So you want to know, is there a TEM1, a functional TEM1 circulating in infections in my community? Or you want the middle, you're willing to think of functional variants, a, a variant of a beta-lactamase that maybe now you don't know what kind of MICs it's going to generate because it's a variant, there's no paper you could point at. Or truly novel emergent AMR genes. Where is your question? What do you want to keep tracking? Also, never mind the degree whether it's a perfect match or a variant, are you interested in acquired resistance genes which tend to be the high threat and are often plasmid borns? Or are you tracking resistance by mutation, which is predominantly genomic, for example? Or the really tough case, trying to understand intrinsic re resistance or efflux or regulatory mutations that cause AMR. And lastly, what are you doing in the lab? 
are you doing culture-based whole genome sequencing, which gives high quality sample of the genome? You tend to find complete AMR genes in these databases. You have large assembly contexts. Or are you doing whole community sequencing, metagenomics, where you're really looking read-based analysis, maybe 250 base pair reads. And so you're not getting complete genes uh, and you're, you're doing the analysis. So these three vectors are part of your decision choice on what you want to learn, what you want to study, or what you want to report. And everything on the left, we're doing extremely well on. Uh, so CARD, all the other databases, NCBI, Res Finder, uh, this area of bioinformatics and AMR is in really good shape. And no surprise that because these known genes that are born on plasmids tend to be high threat and we spend the time investigating them, understanding them. And whole genome shotgun has become a gold standard. So enter back to ACA, the escape pathogens, this works very well. For functional variants and genomic mutations, we're in pretty good shape for, say, tuberculosis or Neisseria gonorrhea, though there's a lot of data harmonization issues in the TB studies. Uh, Reseq TB in the U.S. lost its funding and shut down. We captured their data and kept it. But there's the cryptic study. The WHO has just put out another report. So there's some harmonization and standardization challenges. In this area as well, uh, we have good catalog uh, mutations. But you move out of other pathogens, we don't always know what the mutations conferring resistance, which particular change in a gyrase, which will knock out a fluoroquinolone, for example. Where we're not doing particularly well is prediction of emergent genes or understanding efflux and regulatory mutations. This is understudied. Bioinformatically, there aren't that many great tools for it. As I said, some AI is starting to work on the emergent aspect. But if you're in here, you're much more in a research area as opposed to a tool set that you can use for monitoring, for example. And when we started teaching this course, I used to include whole community sequencing in the red, but there's been a lot of fantastic improvements in the community of working on metagenomics, a lot of pressure when it comes either, you know, working from swabs in the clinic or for a sample from, uh, from wastewater. So uh, a lot of good work on sepsis, uh, trying to figure out what's infecting and what it's resistant to in blood, environmental money, and a lot of One Health AMR looking at soil and farms, for example. So we're going to do a little of this today, but I, I, I'm really happy to say that in you know, the years where I've been teaching this course, this has moved from red to blue. I think the community has put a lot of effort. Okay, so let's talk a bit a little about the biocuration piece. So if you go to Wikipedia or do a lit service, you'll discover a large number of AMR databases. Uh, and we've all managed to get together a couple times uh, to talk about it. Some of these databases haven't been updated in a long time. Some of them do it very, very infrequently. Some of them are updating on a very aggressive schedule. Some are very broad in their scope, and some are very specific uh, on their, their scope. So if you look at ResFinder, originally uh, only focused on the plasmid-borne mobile genes, but they've, they've increased their breadth, for example. There are the big three. Uh, that's the NCBIs, or GenBank's Pathogen Detection Reference Gene Catalog. Uh, it's a really good thing that the NIH and the, and the National Library of Medicine are investing people and money in this. In Denmark, we have the ResFinder, who were really early out of the gate, uh, and then the comprehensive antibiotic resistance base here in Canada. Uh, I will say these big three talk to each other all the time. NCBI and CARD in particular are constantly working to harmonize, uh, and there's some division of labor. NCBI is the leader when it comes to naming beta-lactamases, for example. We follow their lead. How they overlap with the other databases uh, it really will, will vary. Some of them have disappeared uh, in this time. Um, but I guess the, the long and the short of it is, I can't just tell you like what's the best database you'd use. It really depends on your, your question. Um, generally, if you wanna find that, so that green part of the vectors, you know, those known genes on plasmids, any of the big three will work quite well. Uh, they do that. But when it comes to tracking individual mutations or less used antibiotics or rarer resistance mechanisms, uh, we try to do it with CARD, but it's not easy to keep up. So the short answer is you still have some work to do if you're trying to decide what the best database for you. It depends on your question and your problem. So we are going to focus on CARD, uh, but I'm going to put that caveat, right? The CARD, I'm using an example. Uh, you, there are more databases and tools that can use. My goal here in the lecture in the lab is to show what the assumptions are uh, and the caveats are that should apply to any AMR database or algorithm to use. Uh, they apply to CARD, they apply to the rest. It's most important that you're just aware of where these weaknesses and where these strengths are so you can make the appropriate decision. So CARD's a, a web-based database with, as well, online tools or command line tools we use. 
Card's uh, curation uh, paradigm is that, first of all, for a gene to be in the database, there has to be a peer-reviewed publication in PubMed with a clear experimental evidence of elevated MIC, that that gene mutation increases the degree of resistance. Whether that's clinically relevant is a whole separate question. It's an increase in MIC. Some of those are well past cutoffs, some of them not so much. Um, not all databases have this criteria, so the sequences they may include may be simplest on assessment of sequence similarity, but you can't point to a paper and experiment. But in the case of CARD, we do. The only exception is beta-lactamases. Beta-lactamases, we are in the genomic era. We find them through genome sequencing faster than anybody can clone them and do an experiment. There's simply too many. So now the agreed paradigm between NCBI, ResFinder, and, and CARD is that uh, NCBI names beta-lactamases based on sequence uh, and phylogenetics, for example. Uh, and so the vast majority in our databases, you can't point to a paper with MICs, uh, though some people are really trying to go after that problem. And of course, this is sequence-based, so that there has to be a public sequence record in GenBank. No private data can go in there because you can't really do the peer review piece. I want to highlight at the top that card at this screenshot had just shy of 5,200 reference sequences. So that sequences that you could point to a paper in PubMed and actually look up the experiment underneath that. But when you do in silico uh, surveillance, so you look at all the available genomes and plasmas and shotguns, you actually come up to over a quarter million alleles uh, underneath those 5,200 genes. And so while we have 5,200 uh, genes that are characterized, you know, you can point to a paper, there are a lot of variants out there that you have to make some assumptions on whether they're functional or not. And we're going to come back to that. How do you know if a variant is truly an AMR gene or not? So I'm going to introduce this. If, if you go to a page in the CARD website, this is for the ANT6 uh, aminoglycoside resistance gene family. Uh, and you'll find a couple things. At the top, you'll have a permanent uh, ontology ascension, ARO3000225. That will never change, as well as tracking synonyms and having a, a, a written definition. And then there's the antibiotic resistance ontology knowledge base. So this is a large ontology that describes mechanisms, drugs, uh, the, and the gene families underneath, as well as adjuvants that you know suppress resistance, for example. And so this knowledge base gives you a whole bunch of information. It's an ontology, so it's a graph underneath there. And here you see it very flat on a web page. And we don't do this alone. Uh, we work with Emma and Damien and, and Will and uh, many of the people here and internationally at the Genomic Epidemiology Ontology, as well as the ERIDA and the Canadian federal government to make sure the ARO is passing all the criteria that Emma talked about of a good data sharing and data harmonization tool. Uh, we do commercialize a lot of our material the ARO never. Uh, we never commercialize or put any restrictions upon the use of ontologies because we really need data harmonization across the field. So same screenshot, but some things that CARD uh, spends time curating. We will always have points of classification. So any gene in CARD will be assigned a gene family, a resistance mechanism, or a drug class. Uh, because if you have the list in here of, you know, 12, 13, 14 terms describing the gene, which one do you want to summarize? So we provide these three levels sort of for, for summary statistics. You'll always know those. And the QC underneath running it, that we have a high curation rate of gene family to drug class. In fact, the, we, you cannot do a release a card without a hitting 100% success rate uh, on that. So that's the broad, you know, the TEM1, a TEM beta-lactamases affect beta-lactams. Yeah. Less curated is the individual relationships between gene and drug, right? That a mutated gyrase uh, B causes resistance to fluoroquinol, for example. There are uh, over 3,000 of those, but it, it's been very targeted. There is a new international effort. Uh, Kat Holt is doing a lot of the lead of that in the UK for us to start really making well-curated drug gene indices or, or dictionaries. So you'll have for every possible gene and mutation, the list of antibiotics it impacts and to the degree it does. So these rule-based interpretations. As you can guess, this is a huge amount of work. Uh, one drug, uh, one gene might be in 18 different bacterial contexts and therefore impact different antibiotics. Um, as well as the ontology base, we have, of course, the sequences of individual genes. So within the ANT6 family, we have this ANT6IB from Campylobacter. We have its protein and its DNA sequence as a reference. And again, that came from a paper. So you can go and look at the paper and look at the quality of the experiment. 
One of the things that CARD emphasizes is a high trust factor so people can use it. So basically, any concept, any data point undergoes human curation. It's a huge amount of labor, uh, but it means that you have that you know professional eye at every data point. So you have high confidence if it got into CARD, it was carefully inspected. On top of finding a page, so here's the page for the ANT 61A uh, and everything at the top ontology, there is a section on molecular epidemiology. So what CARD does is uh, maybe two, three times a year is it goes to NCBI and for 413 pathogens, it grabs every chromosome, every genomic island, every plasmid and every shotgun assembly and then we annotate it using CARD's RGI software. And what we find is the distribution of perfect matches, in other words, completely identical proteins or sequence variants. And we get now a molecular epidemiology framework. It's useful here on a web page just to know what gene, where is this gene, where does it appear, does it appear in genomic islands and plasmids. But that underlying sequence diversity is actually really important for metagenomic analysis. And we're going to come back to that. This is a huge amount of compute. So this is sort of like a commitment from CARD that two or three times a year, we will burn a lot of CPUs to produce this large data set for people so they don't have to do it themselves. So what is CARD? It's a high quality reference database on the molecular basis of AMR. With this expert curations, I didn't talk about it, we, but we have written AIs that triage literature and guide us to paper. So it's, it's AI assisted curation. Uh, human still enters the data, but an AI might lead you to the right part of the paper. We try to cover everything, all AMR mechanisms and breadth. Uh, we provide uh, the analytics tools, which we're about to do in the demo for gene discovery. And with the ontology, you have tools for data harmonization. Uh, and in particular, for folks in machine learning, uh, there are no standardized nomenclature for all of the AMR genes. Some are lovely in their nomenclature and some are just disastrous. So we have made standardized names for every single gene and variant uh, to support machine learning people. So they have a, a, a stable nomenclature to rely upon. There's dedicated curates and we do an update about once every three months, depending on how busy pandemics keep us. Okay. So all tools, CARD, uh, other tools, rely on some sort of reference data. Again, the big three, ResFinder, CARD, and NCBI. But you actually may find other tools have repackaged the data. They've taken the data from all three, or they've taken CARD to reformat it for their tools. Uh, and so in this case, we're going to show CARD's tool, RGI. But keep in the back of your mind, there's plenty of other tools that use very similar methods. So a few years ago, uh, colleague, colleagues of mine gave this presentation in our, our morning clinical rounds of this person that had an interesting travel history and did everything wrong. Uh, every city they went to or country they went to, they would stop their drug, get sick again, see a new doctor, get a different prescription, not follow that prescription. And by the time we got them here in Hamil Hamilton, they had salmonella living in their spine uh, and were, were near death. Um, they managed to save this patient, but it wasn't easy. Uh, they had a lot of drug resistance. So, you know, you know, being good microbiologists, we got a tap, we cultured it, uh, and we sequenced its genome to understand this. We were worried that because of mistreatment of antibiotics, this person essentially had bred a superbug. So in this case, we did culture-based whole genome shotgun sequencing. We got a very high quality uh, genome. And we ran it through our resistance gene identifier. So this is our software that will compare that genome to all the knowledge in CARD and tell me what genes are possibly in this genome. So this is the visualization you'll get on the website. On the outside are all the individual genes that were in this salmonella. So first answer is, yeah, this is a superbug. Not the worst we've seen by far, but your average food poisoning case salmonella does not have this many boxes on the outside. And those genes are broken down into three types, perfect, strict, and loose. Now, this search, uh, loose was turned off, so really we're only going to talk about perfect and strict. So the perfect is means that the encoded protein was identical to the one described in the paper with an experiment behind it. So very high likelihood this was functional. So SOL2, for example, for sulfinamides. In gold, uh, all the stricts, where variants of known AMR genes in the literature, where our modeling suggests it's a functional variant. But you do have the caveat that that particular variant has never been cloned and expressed and described in a paper. And despite our best modeling, we could be wrong. It could be a false positive, uh, for example. And you please keep that in mind for any tools you use. If it is a variant, you can make your best assessment on whether it's a functional variant, but nothing surpasses cloning and expressing yeah, in a lab. So you got to keep that in mind. 
Using the ontology, we can reorganize the data instead of by genes, but by drug classes. So if we look at these are the exact same genes, but if we look at the inner of the wheel, we see drug classes. And particularly if you look at the, the dead bottom of it, you'll see the cephalosporin uh, uh, antibiotics. There were 13 genes encoding resistance to that drug class. Not a surprise, you would use that to treat salmonella. Um, but even aminoglycosides near the top, two genes conferring uh, resistance. This is a lot of drug classes that are under threat uh, from this genome, from this pathogen. So again, not a surprise that this was hard to treat. Never mind it was in the spine, which is a hard place to get antibiotics uh, to, for example. But this shows you have having an ontology in a, a structured language, a graph of knowledge means you can quickly reanalyze data from any perspective. The first slide was the perspective of genes and their families. The second slide is about drugs and their classes. So this perfect strict and loose thing goes all the way back to threat theory. So RGI works with the same model. Perfects are the known knowns. At the amino acid level, it's the same protein as described in the paper and curated in card. At the strict, it is a variant of a known gene. We know those are known unknowns out there. So it's not been cloned and published and described, but we think it is a functional variant. And we're going to come back to how you make that decision. And then loose is when you find a sequence that's similar, but it's outside of our detection model cutoffs. Uh, be honest, most people don't use loose. Many public health settings only use perfect because their mandate is to count and report on known genes. How common is CTMX15 in my environment, uh, my community, for example? So they're not interested in variants. It's not their mandate to report variants, and it's certainly not their mandate to, to report things that are very distantly related to antibiotics. But if you've got a phenotype you can't explain, uh, you'll start looking at the strict. Is this variant of TEM1 the one that's reason causing beta lactams? Researchers use that. Most people, again, only use perfect and strict. The only time you'll be you know, inclined to turn on loose is when you can't explain your phenotype. If you look at all the genes that are perfect or strict and they don't cover a drug class that's failing uh, in your treatment, now you've possibly got something new. And that's where you open up to loose. So researchers that look at you know, the evolution of AMR work in the loose space, uh, for example, uh, for people that work on geologically isolated regions that have never been exposed to a monitored antibiotic, they have to use the loose to find the proto-resistome. But also, unfortunately, at public health, there's one or two a year where the loose discovers a new AMR gene and a new gene family gets reported. Again, this is based on similarity to CARD. So if it's a new gene that's entirely new, a true emergent threat that has no sequence similarity to anything we've seen before, RGI won't work. It's all based on sequence similarity. But how do you know that something is a strict functional variant or loose, uh, something that you really should be very careful of and clone? So we use it, uh, what CARD is unique is that it's not only a collection of sequences, but they're all kept within a bioinformatics model framework. And this is the big caveat I want you to come away with. The vast majority of tools are using some sort of sequence similarity algorithm to say, hey, that gene was a TEM1. Many of them do not have any cutoffs or assessment for false positive and false negative rates. And so you will get a hit. And so I refer to them as bags of sequences. These are databases that they're using BLAST, say, to compare their infectious, the, the genome they sequenced against their bag of sequences, and they are going to get results. CARD goes the steps that for every sequence goes in the CARD, we model cutoffs to know if it's strict or loose. There's many kinds of models. The first one is called a protein homolog model. Essentially think of it, is the presence or absence of a gene? And this is the largest portion of CARD. Uh, think of beta-lactamases, for example. Either you have a beta-lactamase or you don't in your genome. This is, in this case, an aminoglycoside gene, ANT61A. There's the protein. And what we do is we compare that protein sequence by BLAST against all the known ANT6 resistance genes. And what you get is this HSP, this high-scoring pair. The more similar sections there are between your gene in a reference, the higher, the, the, the bigger the HSP is and the more bits of information it contains. And we eventually look for a breakpoint where when we match our, our, our ANT61A from the literature to all the aminoglycoside resistance GNAs, uh, genes out there, 
at what point is there a break point if you fall below a bit score it's actually not a resistance gene anymore it's something related to ant6 but it's not a resistance gene so a human being has to look at all the known sequences and all the databases and the planets and figure out is there a break point between things that are related to ant6 that cause resistance and things that are related to ant6 that do not cause resistance and they pick a bit score cutoff which reflects the number of bits if you're above that bit score cutoff you're a strict You've got lots of information, lots of similarity. You're based on what's been studied. You're probably a functional variant. That doesn't mean there might be one substitution that kills the binding site. It's not that precise. It's statistical in nature only. But if the bit score is below 500, it is most likely something related to ANT6 that has nothing to do with antibiotics. It's interacting with other small molecules. This is about two-thirds of CARD. About two-thirds of AMR is protein homolog, the presence or absence of it. A huge amount of labor goes into this. The next biggest chunk of models are what are called protein variant models. So this is a gyrase, gyrase B. All bacteria have a gyrase B gene. The bit score cutoff is simply used to find the gyrase B. B. Uh, if you're below this, above this bit score, the gene that we're annotating is the gyrase B. Uh, so in particular, because often in this case, the reference uh, is from Helicobacter pylori. But what if you are analyzing a different species of Helicobacter or a completely different type of bacteria? You won't get a perfect match because you now have evolutionary divergence, but the bit score corrects for that. But the algorithm doesn't stop there. If you only did that, you would always get a positive because all bacteria have gyrase B in them. It's an essential gene. But then it does mapping to compare to mutations from the literature. Does it have any of these mutations that are known to confer resistance, in this case, to fluoroquinolones? And so it's a two-step algorithm, and this is the second largest chunk of CARD, is these housekeeping genes that pick up mutations that confer resistance. So again, this is an AI-assisted curation of the literature to report every mutation. And I'll put the caveat here. The quality of the literature varies. So if you look at gyrase B mutations in clinical settings, bacteria that are infecting humans, the literature is quite good. When you find the R484K mutation uh, substitution, there's a good experiment behind it. You buy it. Uh, but if you then look at gyrase B mutations in salmonella and agricultural settings, and you read that literature, often the data is correlative, not experimental, that there's a strong correlation of R484K with resistance, but no one's directly tested it. Right now, that level of data does not get into CARD, with the exception of tuberculosis that has a rigorous likelihood statistic framework that it uses. No other pathogen uses that. So you have to keep in mind is where's the quality of evidence you know, for the mutations underneath? And not everything's going to make it in the CARD. When we hire young undergraduate curators, I think their first you know, they, they have their shock day when they finally realize that not every paper is high quality, that not every experiment is well performed. But again, two-step algorithm. Altogether, every sequence in CARD fits within eight model frameworks. Homolog model, variant model, ribosomal RNA gene mutations, mutations and regulators. So, you know, you give examples here. Homolog model, presence or absence, like a beta-lactamase. Variant, mutated gyrase B. RNA, a mutated 23S RNA. Uh, protein expression, upregulated uh, multidrug resistance in Pseudomonas. Protein knockout, my favorite, Cinobacter baumannii just removes the target altogether, deletes the gene from its genome. And then really complicated ones on the bottom, like vancomycin, which is an entire cluster that has to be entirely co-expressed to get the change in the cell wall, or efflux pump systems with, with, with interesting regulatory networks. This is the next big point. There is not a single database, or let me say it again, not a single piece of software on the planet that can predict all possible drivers of resistance. So while everything you see on the screen here is curated into CARD, we haven't written code to actually annotate it in sequencing data. So RGI can't do it yet. In fact, RGI can only do the four at the top that are in green. And three of them have an asterisk, which means we haven't finished writing code for all the different kinds of mutations yet. We're really good at SNPs, but not deletions, for example. The two at the bottom, we've done preliminary work, but we're a long way from. And your TA, Karen, this is her PhD. She wants the first one that have software that can annotate in sequencing data every bit of knowledge in CARD under these eight model frameworks. To say she's brave is an understatement. Okay, 
everything we talked about there was culture-based, high quality, well-assembled genomes. But what about culture-free metagenomics? So in my case, it's often a swab from a kid in the NICU, uh, but this also could be environmental assessment, such as uh, wastewater or agricultural runoff. This uh, poorly uh, proportioned figure gets the main point from that when you do culture free, you're sequencing all the DNA in a complex sample. And a large fraction will be the DNA that's supposed to be there, uh, you know, it, the baby, right, from the NICU, the human DNA, or fish poop, right, uh, an invertebrate fly uh, root, but also all the bacteria that are meant to be there. So, bifidobacter, in the case of the baby, and a huge swath of bacteria uh, in a wastewater runoff. So of all the sequencing data you would get through sequencing, a tiny, tiny sliver is the any pathogen, and a tiny sliver of that is the AMR, and it's overestimated in this graphic. So AMR genes are the needle in the haystack. It takes a lot of sequencing even just to detect them at the sequencing level. So you end up doing tens of millions of reads per sample, spending way too much money. But because you're sampling all these genomes when you're sequencing, you get short reads, it's very fragmentary, 250 base pair fragments, a, a, a horrible jigsaw puzzle uh, of data. And as I'll show you, analysis of this is very, very sensitive diversity of reference data. Sure, we're going to see the data in a minute, but CARD is largely clinical. So it works really well from that swab from the baby. But if you're environmental, there's not a lot in CARD of environmental variants. So you can be very sensitive to that. And then you have the problem that even if you find the AMR gene, it's really important to know which bacteria or plasmid was bearing it. Because in the case of clinic, the, giving them resistance is only so helpful. They actually need to know what kind of bacteria they're dealing with to make their first antibiotic choice. In the case of wastewater, if you find that there's a big AMR burden, you're going to want to know which bacteria are responsible for that, presumably a gut microbe. So this comes to where did that short sequencing read come from? And this is what's called the Burroughs-Wheeler transform or read mapping. And you've heard bits and pieces of this in the lectures. Essentially, you have a reference genome and you have a whole bunch of short sequencing reads and you need to map them positionally by sequence similarity to that genome. You could use BLAST uh, in, in to do this. It would take forever. It's not designed for that. So people have made custom tools for read mapping uh, or Burroughs-Wheeler transform. The most two you'll hear about is the BWA or the Bowtie 2 algorithms. Essentially, it maps each of these short sequent reads to the genome. And then if a section of a genome encodes a gene you care about, you count up how many reads were aligned there to get your idea of relative abundance. This is good computer science. Uh, this uh, was really inefficient 10 years ago. It's just getting better and better, the speeds, which is good because again, you're sequencing tens of millions of reads. You need efficient uh, bioinformatics. But AMR is actually really difficult for this. So next caveat to keep in your mind is what's called the AMR allele network problem. And not all tools acknowledge this and deal with this. So these are the TEM beta lactamases. There are hundreds of variants of TEM. Some of them are only one nucleotide difference. They're practically the same sequence. But if you get a change in amino acid, you get a new name. So that can come down to one nucleotide. So they're all highly similar. But those read alignment tools, Bowtie, BWA, they were designed with the human genome in mind, where there really weren't that many copies of genes. There really, if they looked at any particular sequencing fragment from a human sample, there really was only one place in the genome to align it to, with the exception of beta tubulin. We all have two copies of the beta tubulin gene. So these algorithms were not designed in the fact that the reference database was highly redundant and had hundreds upon hundreds of very similar sequences. And what these algorithms do is they start guessing uh, at this stage. And I'm actually going to show you what that is. So we simulated a complex sample. So on the right, there's a whole bunch of genes. The ones with the red arrow are the ones we simulated at tenfold coverage metagenomic sequencing. So everything works well. We should only get 10 genes out of this analysis. That simulated data, we did Bowtie 2 against CARD. So three things to see. The y-axis on the right, we found more than seven genes. So the reads are being assigned to more than the, se the seven genes that were simulated, and it wasn't random. So if we take a look at CTMX15, that's the gene that we simulated, 
And some of the reads, in fact, were mapped to CTMX15, but some were mapped to CTMX, CTXM101, CTXM114, CTXM157, and CTXM3. So very similar things happen with the beta, other beta lactamases, for example. It's because there's such similar reference sequences that the algorithm knows it's got a CTXM, but it's starting to guess on which one it has. So this suggests if, uh, if you read the literature where people have, say, sequenced soil, and they've used card and, be, and bow tie two, and they give you a long list of, oh my God, look at how many resistance genes in this soil, they're probably wrong because of the allele network problem. The two other things you want to notice, we'll look at the x-axis. The completely mapped reads is maxing out at 350. And so there's three genes that have good density uh, of reads. Those three genes happen to not have an allele network problem, such as the AA6-6 prime. So not all of CARD has an allele network problem. And when you don't, it works like you would hope it to. You get all the reads assigned to the gene you simulated. But if you again look at the x-axis, the bulk of them are on the far left. Very few genes being spread out over a lot of allelic variants. And lastly, the y-axis on the left, this map Q. This is a read mapping, overall read mapping quality assessment. A map Q value of 35 is not good. It's low, low quality mapping. So there's nothing wrong with the Bowtie 2 algorithm but it was designed for a human or a mouse genome, not designed for a diverse allele network like AMR. So then comes ResFinder to the rescue. So the Danish team in Copenhagen knew this, recognized this, and they invented a new aligning tool called KMA. KMA is very much like Bowtie 2, but it's knowledgeable. It's designed for highly redundant databases. It has extra KMR-based steps to actually try and get it right. So here's the exact same data. Look on the y-axis on the left, the BAPQ value is 194. We're getting high quality mapping. The completely mapped reads is 550. But in particular, we simulated seven genes and we only aligned reads to seven genes. Five of them are in red, so that's the exact gene we simulated. Two of them in green, and they actually the algorithm picked a slightly different variant than the one we simulated. So it tells you we're not perfect here. Seven genes went in, seven genes came out, but two of them were just slightly off on which allele uh, we had. So no algorithm is perfect for this. So again, having the back of your mind that if you sequence soil to look for AMR and you do a bow tie two, you would have come up with a list like this and been, been terrified about resistance. But if you use KMA, you'll come up with a more realistic to it. So uh, almost begging, if you're going to do metagenomics uh, with AMR or any other resist highly redundant data set, like a virulence reference data set, you have to use an aligner that's aware of highly uh, redundant allele networks like KMA. And if you use our RGI tool, it's the default. Uh, you can force it to use Bowtie 2, but we strongly recommend you don't. There's another aspect of the allele network. So CARD has all these genes in it. It's from the literature. The literature is overwhelmingly clinical infections in people. So if you're analyzing data that came from a clinical setting, whether it be you know a patient or wastewater, uh, the read mapping algorithm is going to work great because there's going to be a lot of sequence similarity between your read and the reference in card. But what if you're sequencing an environment like a river, right, uh, or soil at a pig farm, for example? The diversity of sequences that are out there are not reflected in CARD. And in fact, no matter how good KMA is, it's looking for highly specific matches, and it may give you a false positive simply because its reference is clinical sequence base and your sample is agricultural sequence base. This is important bias in every database, that they're clinically, the money gets spent, CHR, clinical sequencing. So that goes back to our molecular epidemiology. One of the reasons we go back and we get every genome assembly plasma genomic island from NCBI is a lot of those are not clinical. And we come up with all the sequence variants, the quarter million, 266,000 uh, sequence variants for, that are perfect or strict hits. And this creates a new reference set. The caveat here is if you just use canonical card, every sequence is you can point to a paper and an experiment. If you're using this set with its perfect and strict, a large fraction are in silico 
prediction of variance with no paper behind them. Everything, it's RGI's strict issue that we model through bit scores that a high confidence that it's functional, but that doesn't mean we can point to an experiment. So if you're doing metagenomics, this is our suggested workflow. You've got your sequencing reads, you've cleaned them up, you've done everything to pre-process your data. And if you're working with clinically sourced material, just use the card canonical, the 5,000 some odd sequences. But if your sample has environmental, agricultural, non-clinical sources, you should also include the card in silico variants as your reference set. Use the KMA aligner, no matter if you're using one or both of these as your reference set, and you'll get counts of genes against sequences. So if you've got good hands in the lab, you made nice libraries, you sequenced in an unbiased manner, you use the appropriate references with the appropriate aligner, you'll get something like this the relative abundance of genes in your sample based on the number of aligned reads. So this sample TETQ is the most dominant gene and TETX4 is barely detected uh, in the example. This is the dominant output of metagenomics work. The key thing I might put you is our algorithms, basically everybody algorithms is only working in protein homolog space. It's sequence similarity. It's not doing checking for the known SNPs that cause AMR. So you're not actually analyzing total resistome. You're only using protein homologs. That means you're not looking for mut mutated gyrase B, for example. So fluoroquinolone resistance is grossly underestimated by this because it tends to be mutation of a housekeeping gene. We're working on it. Other groups are working on it to get there. And uh, the Sears group, uh, that's a piece of software out of Florida, have got a, a good start here. But even if you found the genes, who's carrying them? Uh, so we are developing a method using KMERS to actually basically the flavor of the genes. Oh, you found a TEM1 beta lactamase, but what sequence variant is it? Is it a variant that's only known from E. coli, only known from Klebsiella, known from a highly mobile plasmid? Uh, we are just writing up this paper The I will say the algorithm is available in card. It is not efficient. It takes far too long to run, but the simulations are showing at least it's accurate. Uh, in a large number of cases, give us a sequencing variant. And because of that molecular epidemiology card acquires, we can use KMERS and tell you, nope, that was E. coli carrying that, was Klebsiella carrying that, for example. Next phase of this project is to make it better computer science so it gets done in a much more efficient manner. But going back to this homolog model question, one of the things you can do is you can align against, you have the choice. Now, normally when you use RGI, uh, it says, hey, I'm going to use KMA against the protein homologs. But you can force it to use KMA against all the protein variants, all the mutation and regulators, all of it. And again, it's not keeping an eye on the mutations, but you can subassemble. Sub so if you get a bunch of reads that are aligning to the gyrase B gene, you can subassemble that and generate a consensus allele. And then you can use the RGI main, the, the tool that actually does protein variant models and all the rest. In practice, you'll see groups that do metagenomic sequencing and then do metagenomic assembly and then use RGI main to look at all the point mutations and all the rest. We're not quite ready to publish this, but we're getting evidence that instead, if you use read mapping to narrow the assembly question down to a gene by gene subassembly, you get better data uh, out of it. Uh, I'm putting caveats on that. We still have work to do to be 100% sure of that. So this is uh, a lot of groups are interested in this question that to get total resistance out of metagenomics. Now in practice, most people are doing say wastewater surveillance are not interested in the point mutations. They're interested in the plasmid borne beta lactamases, et cetera. And this works just great for that because those tend to be the high threat genes. I will announce uh, there's an issue of equity. These algorithms are, as you'll see in the lab, use a lot of compute power. Not every lab has that compute power. So we did a collaboration with the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, and there's now available uh, through their CZID, say, I guess CZ, their American ID uh, platform, uh, all of RGI and its databases are incorporated in there. And if you do metagenomic sequencing, it actually flows through an assembly-based uh annotation using RGI main, as well as a read mapping based annotation using KMA RGI BWT. 
uh, and gives you a uh, harmonized results of that using the antibiotic ontology. This is free to researchers and public health. Uh, it's just you can't use it for any form of commercial research. research. So if you're finding computationally you're under-resourced to do some of your metagenomic work, this is solution number one. Solution number two is lab-based bait capture. So 2019, we were doing metagenomics, spending far too much money sequencing. So we invented a bait capture system where we took every gene and card and we designed an RNA molecular fish hook, a bait. So we could take our Illumina libraries from a metagenomic sample, run them against those fish hooks, and all that would be kept in the tube are the AMR genes. Everything else would wash out of the tube. So what you would have is now a concentrated sequencing library of just the AMR genes. And in fact, if you looked on this graph, the, the six columns on the right, where when we did, we did not do the bait capture enrichment, we just did shotgun, every row is a gene. And you can see, we don't even see a lot of the genes or they're faint. The exact same samples on the, the left, the enriched columns, where we did the enrichment and we sequenced to the exact same depth, suddenly your detection levels skyrocketed to the point now when you do enrichment, you simply just do not have to sequence near as much. About 100,000 reads is all you need as opposed to millions of reads. Uh, so this is a, a targeted enrichment to get high detection levels. At the time, the bait synthesis itself, you had to use a commercial vendor and it was not cheap. Uh, you still save money as opposed to sequencing, you know, 20 million reads a sample, but it did make a, a massive uh, drop. But last month, we released the AMR Bait Capture Platform 2, the preprints out available on the CARD website. Uh, one of the things we changed is, you know, we made our original bait set 2019 and never updated. Now we've written the bioinformatics that every single release of CARD, it will release an updated bait design. Uh, so you can pick, you can use by versions. So if a new gene family shows up, it will, it will immediately be in there. Uh, a PhD student in our group invented an in-house bait synthesis protocol. So you do not have to use commercial vendors. This has reduced the cost of bait capture, AMR metagenomics by two orders of magnitude. Uh, and so uh, it's really been a game changer. Multiple, some of our colleagues on this call and Canadian federal agencies are validating it as a tool for the national platform. Everything's available on the website, uh, whether you want to actually still have them commercially synthesized or you want to synthesize them yourselves. And honestly, if, if, if you got to, you want to do a small amount of validation, just email me and we'll send you, send you some aliquots just so you can give it a shot. But this is the other way. If computationally, you're overwhelmed, you don't have the server, be smarter at the bench. Just generate less data that has a much higher detection level. So you just don't need that many CPUs in the first place. Okay, analytics, quick little bit uh, to end. So this is the idea, a lot of research going that if I sequence it, can I predict exactly well how it will behave? Um, so if we sequence a bunch of clinical E. coli, in our case, 115 isolates from clinics in our community, sequence those genome, can we predict with accuracy drug failure, uh, for example? How we predict it is we use the antibiotic resistance ontology. It has statements saying this gene causes resistance against that drug. Now, they're qualitative statements. There's no MICs in there. That's called rules-based prediction. And if you take 150 E. coli isolates, you test them with a Vitec on 18 antibiotics, and then sequence their genome and predict the genes by RGI, then take those rules and say, if you got this gene, you lost this drug, this is what you get. If it's in gold or yellow, the bright colors, we got it wrong. Either we predicted resistance or susceptible, and it was actually the opposite. So if you look at, say, like miropenem, we're actually doing really well. The rules in the ontology are quite reliable. Uh, you can see by other antibiotics, we're approaching 0% productivity, and a lot of them are sitting around 50%. This is because just because a bacteria has a gene doesn't mean it's going to express it at a level that creates a clinical MIC, right? There's a big gap there. So instead, we switched to logistic regression, a machine learning method. And we redid this study where we kept a subset to train the data, to find the patterns in the genomes that were strongly correlated with the phenotypic resistance we, we measured by Vitec. <laughs> and we made a machine learning predictive model, and then we ran that against these 115 E. coli, and now we do really well. We get to really high prediction levels. So this is, the literature is full of groups doing this uh, research of, can I predict 
phenotype very precisely uh, from genotype. And the next metaphor will be, can I predict risk very actively from a metagenomic sample, for example? Um, there's a lot of promise uh, in this, and but I'm going to put some caveats. Uh, but before I do the caveats, uh, there was a, a byproduct from a curator. So this is a machine learning method. It's called a glass box. You can open it up and say, well, well why did you get it right? So we looked at cefazolin. And the machine learning suggested that the biggest driver for resistance of the cefazolin was CTMX15. But we looked in the literature and no one had ever tested that drug against that beta-lactamase. It was actually only tested against three drugs. So the machine learning was predicting new knowledge. Uh, and in fact, it predicted new substrate activity for six beta-lactamases. So we went down the hall to the lab of Jerry Wright here at McMaster, who has an efflux deficient expressions platform for AMR called the antibiotic resistance platform. Because it's efflux division you, and it's got all other AMR removed, you can directly test the gene. And in fact, the machine learning was right out of six out of six times when it predicted a broader substrate activity of a beta-lactamase that had ever been tested and reported in the literature. It was right six out of six times. So there's a huge promise here, right? Because scientific discovery, honestly, when people find a new isolate or a new gene, they test the handful of antibiotics in their freezer. There's no systematic effort and it drives curators like me crazy. But machine learning can really help guide you. This was super cool. But if you repeat the study in Pseudomonas aeruginosa, uh, which generally from CF patients in our area, and I'm not even gonna show you the graph. Almost there, Nia. Um, I'm not gonna show you the graph. It, you just with machine learning, you still couldn't get reliable. So not all bacteria are going to be good for phenotypic prediction. And in fact, that E. coli model, which works great in Hamilton, if I take it to Windsor, Ontario, it no longer works because the genetic background is different. So AMR is local and machine learning you design for phenotype prediction is also local. Of course, then AMR also evolves. So on a practical level, if you wanted surveillance using machine learning to resistance, you're going to have to rebuild your machine learning like every couple of years because the genomic background changes and you have to build it separately in every municipality to get it right. So there are very practical limits uh, to making this work. Okay, closing thoughts. So context is everything. Um, Finding an AMR gene is one part, but you've heard a lot about in this lab and particularly the next two labs you're going to do uh, with Finn and, and Rob about context of, of plasmid born. So a lot of effort going into CARD and others to actually give you that context. Hey, you found the AMR gene, but is it sitting on a chromosome or a plasmid? Does the pathogen form biofilms? How do you make a decision? How do you deploy your molecular knowledge, right? Out of all the genes, you might find 40 or 50 AMR determinants in a particular isolate. What's important? What do you use to make your decisions? Capacity and technology are key to you, right? What's your breadth and volume of culture capacity? How much computation do you have to do genome assembly or read mapping? Or are you going to use this Chan Zuckerberg? How do you keep up with 5,000 genes and the knowledge base? Um, as Jared talked about, how can you be sure the SNP isn't sequencing error when you're calling AMR? And generally speaking, plasmid genes are easy to find in genome assemblies, but getting the complete plasmid is very hard. Uh, but I'm going to highlight, we've been using, and, and I have nothing to do with this company, but we've been using Plasmidosaurus. Uh, we do, we culture up the bacteria. They originally were only to sequence your plasmid, but honestly, if you send them the DNA from a culture of your bacteria, we get complete chromosomes and plasmids back that are high quality. So this is changing a lot. How tight is the genotype phenotype relationship? Some SNPs are potent and some of them are additive. When does efflux matter? Pseudomonas efflux can be a big determinant of clinical resistance. And other bacteria, not so much. How good is the underlying science? And when you look at CARD, you know, does it say that this is pretty poor science behind here? Nanopore sequencing, long read, is getting cheaper and faster. You do need GPU processors, which can be a burden. But you combine it with Illumina, and you can get complete G chromosomes and plasmids. And as you'll learn in the, the next today and tomorrow, plasmid analysis software like MobSuite from FAC is just getting better and better. Really examined by uh, bait capture. Certainly for AMR beta genomics, we think it's a game chaser to bypass it, but we're getting regular requests to build panels just to isolate C. diff or pylori out of stool samples because they don't want a culture, particularly C. diff requires a, a, an oxygen free chamber. But you know, if you're not doing culture, how can, uh, it, you know, if it's a big outbreak, how can you scale up, for example? 
Metagenomics has taken off. Uh, Canada, many other municipalities are sequencing the food chain or sequencing wastewater. Uh, sequencing costs are dropping a lot. Uh, baiting can help out a lot. Um, but you got to really pay attention to your read alignment algorithms like KMA. Uh, and the things we see at a practical level, sequencing costs are dropping, but a library prep costs on the, on the Illumina side are really not changing it at all. Uh, so that it's sort of keeping you, our, our costs from getting any lower means for us, uh, you know, we can do small outbreaks quickly, but we're really not able to do big outbreaks quickly. But when you go to smaller samples, your, your economy of scale is lost and it costs more money. So <clears throat> barcoding and robotics are the, are, are the future. The, the Iron Chef uh, sequencer that has its own library construction robot is a real possibility for doing this uh, sort of turn rapid clinical turnaround. And some of that, I, you know, Jared talked about us doing signal work with, with coronavirus. I think that was the lesson we learned. We do AMR sort of on a long-term battle and a sort of a national surveillance. With COVID, we learned that, you know, five-day turnaround is what a clinician's needs in the middle of a pandemic. So how do we prep for that with, with AMR? And there we go, a couple minutes over, but we are on our break. <laughs>